Born in Corsica in 1769 to Carlo and Letizia Bonaparte, Napoleon was the second of eight surviving children. His father was a lawyer and minor noble, but the family was far from wealthy. Young Napoleon grew up with the smell of the sea in the air and the weight of a newly imposed French rule on his shoulders. Despite being minor nobility, the Bonapartes lived a relatively modest life. They were far removed from the glittering sophistication of Paris. Young Napoleon was an avid reader, consuming works on history and strategy, foreshadowing his future endeavors. When he was sent to mainland France for schooling, Napoleon was confronted with a deep sense of otherness. He spoke with a Corsican accent and was taunted for it. But he didn't let this deter him. In fact, it fortified his determination. At just 15, he graduated from the military academy in Paris, ranking 42nd out of 58 students. Despite his modest rank, his expertise in artillery was already apparent. His love for mathematics and strategy shone through, setting the stage for what would become a meteoric rise through the ranks of the French military. His early years might not have been extraordinary, but the flames of ambition were already alight. Napoleon's eyes were set firmly on a future that few could have imagined, a future that would forever change the landscape of Europe. The École Militaire in Paris was a far cry from the modest surroundings of Napoleon's Corsican home. Established by King Louis XV, this institution aimed to produce military officers who were as skilled in academics as they were in warfare. Even within the esteemed halls of the academy, Napoleon was an outlier. He was younger than most of his peers and came from a far less affluent background. While others engaged in the pleasures and diversions of young men, Napoleon was often found in the library, buried in books on history, mathematics, and military strategy. His instructors soon recognized his affinity for artillery and mathematics. Although his overall class ranking was not stellar, his aptitude in these areas was unmistakable. He excelled in geometry and studied the works of great military tacticians, absorbing lessons that he would later apply on the battlefield with deadly efficiency. Not everything was about book learning, though. The Academy also provided practical experience through war games and field exercises. Napoleon displayed remarkable acumen in these exercises, which allowed him to stand out even among his more privileged peers. These formative years at the École Militaire were more than just an education for Napoleon. They were a crucible that forged his identity as a military genius in the making. His keen understanding of artillery and strategy, as well as his relentless ambition, were honed within these walls, setting the stage for a career that would both awe and terrify the world. Our first real glimpse into Napoleon's military prowess comes during the tumultuous years of the French Revolution, specifically at the Siege of Toulon in 1793. Toulon had opened its gates to a British and Spanish fleet, posing a significant threat to revolutionary France. The French forces faced a formidable challenge in reclaiming Toulon. The city was well fortified and backed by the naval power of Britain and Spain. Initial attempts to take the city floundered, demonstrating a dire need for effective leadership and strategy. Enter Napoleon Bonaparte, a 24-year-old artillery captain with fervent revolutionary zeal and an astute understanding of artillery warfare. He was quickly noticed by his superiors and given command of the artillery, a role he took on with relish. Napoleon made immediate changes, improving the placement and effectiveness of the artillery. His plans focused on capturing key fortifications, cutting off supply lines to the British fleet, and isolating the enemy within the city. It was a masterstroke that dramatically shifted the tide of the battle. His strategies worked, the siege was broken, and Toulon was reclaimed. For his remarkable achievements, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General at the age of 24. Not only did this mark the end of British hopes to hold a fortified position in the south of France, but it also marked the beginning of Napoleon's meteoric rise in the French military. The siege of Toulon wasn't just a military victory. It was a showcase of Napoleon's strategic brilliance, audacity, and incredible ambition. Traits that would soon make him a household name across Europe and earn him a place among history's greatest military commanders. 
Amidst the political turbulence and rising military aspirations, a different kind of intrigue unfolded in Napoleon's life. Love. Meet Josephine de Beauharnais, a widowed socialite six years Napoleon's senior, with two children from her previous marriage. The couple met in 1795, at a time when Napoleon was rising through military ranks, and Josephine was trying to navigate life post-revolution. She was captivating, known for her beauty, wit, and charm. Napoleon was instantly smitten. While Napoleon was away on campaigns, the two exchanged numerous passionate letters. Napoleon's letters were especially fervent, filled with declarations of love and longing. His letters would often begin with phrases like, to live for Josephine, emphasizing his deep emotional attachment. They were married on March 9, 1796, in a civil ceremony. Napoleon wore his uniform, and Josephine wore a simple muslin dress. Despite the absence of grandeur, for Napoleon, it was a union of not just strategic alliances, but of heartfelt affection. Their marriage had its complications. Napoleon's military duties often took him far from home, and Josephine faced social and political challenges in his absence. But her influence was palpable. She often served as a political advisor and even managed civil affairs while he was away. The marriage faced trials, including the issue of not having an heir, which led to their eventual separation. However, even after their marriage was annulled, Napoleon insisted Josephine retain the title of Empress. She remained the great love of his life. Their relationship wasn't just about love or politics. It was a complex tapestry of passion, ambition, and the intricacies of power. For Napoleon, Josephine was not just a wife, but a confidant, advisor, and the woman who humanized him in ways that history often overlooks. Just days after his marriage to Josephine in 1796, Napoleon was given command of the French Army of Italy, a posting that was seen more as an exile than a promotion. The army was ill-fed, poorly supplied, and had been stuck in a military quagmire for months. When Napoleon took command, he found an army dispirited and demoralized. In response, he didn't just issue orders, he inspired his men, promising them glory and riches from conquered territories. Soldiers, you are naked and ill-fed, he declared. Rich provinces and great cities will be in your power. There you will find honor, glory, and riches. One of the first indications of his genius came at the Battle of Lodi. Against a well-fortified Austrian position, Napoleon took personal command of his men, leading them across a bridge under a hail of fire. The battle was a French victory and significantly boosted the army's morale. But Lodi was just the beginning. His innovative use of artillery, rapid troop movements, and ability to divide and conquer his adversaries set him apart as a military genius. In battle after battle, he outwitted Austrian generals, breaking apart their coalitions and causing mass surrenders. His triumphs culminated in the Treaty of Campo Formio, which ended the war against the Austrians and reshaped the Italian peninsula. Napoleon's victories in Italy forced Austria to recognize French acquisitions, turning him into a national hero in France. Beyond military victories, the Italian campaign also filled French coffers and even contributed to French culture as Napoleon ordered the transport of Italian art and artifacts back to France. The Italian campaign was a turning point, not just for France, but for Napoleon himself. He had not just conquered territory, he had conquered the imagination of his countrymen. The young Corsican general was now a force to be reckoned with, setting the stage for even greater ambitions. After his sweeping victories in Italy, Napoleon set his sights on a new prize, Egypt. In 1798, he embarked on an ambitious expedition with a twofold purpose, to disrupt British trade routes to India and to spread the ideas of the French Revolution to the East. The expedition was an enormous undertaking, involving more than 300 ships and 35,000 men. They landed in Alexandria in July 1798, quickly capturing the city but facing challenges they hadn't anticipated. 
such as the harsh desert climate and strong local resistance. Napoleon faced the Mamluks, Egypt's ruling military caste, in the Battle of the Pyramids. Despite being vastly outnumbered, the French used innovative square formations to repel cavalry charges, securing a decisive victory. But the Egyptian campaign was not solely a military endeavor. Napoleon brought along 167 scholars and scientists, forming the Institute of Egypt in Cairo. They were tasked with studying Egyptian history, culture, and natural resources. A genuine effort to bridge the gap between the East and the West. Among the expedition's significant contributions to knowledge was the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. Found by a French soldier, this artifact had inscriptions in three scripts, hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek, providing the key to deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs. Despite initial successes, the Egyptian campaign ultimately faltered. The British destroyed the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile, stranding Napoleon's forces. Plague, local uprisings, and logistical problems took their toll, and a frustrated Napoleon returned to France in 1799, leaving his army behind. While the Egyptian campaign was a military setback for Napoleon, its cultural and scientific impact was profound. It captivated the European imagination, introduced Egyptology as a field of study, and left an indelible mark on our understanding of ancient civilizations. When Napoleon returned to France from Egypt in 1799, he found a nation in turmoil. The French Revolution had spawned rival factions, economic instability, and a disenchanted populace. The government of the day, known as the Directory, was especially unpopular and ineffective. Sensing an opportunity and encouraged by key political figures like Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès, Napoleon began to plot. He saw a chance to bring stability to France and, not incidentally, to elevate his own political status. The plan was to overthrow the Directory and replace it with a new form of government. On November 9, 1799, known as 18th Brumaire, in the French Revolutionary calendar, the coup was enacted. It was a day of high drama. When Napoleon entered the Council of 500, he was met with hostility and even physical threats. His brother Lucien, president of the council, helped to quell the chaos and turn the tide. The coup was successful. The directory was dissolved and a new government called the consulate was established. Napoleon was named first consul, sharing power, at least nominally, with two other consuls, CAS and Ducos. However, it was clear who held the reins. As first consul, Napoleon initiated sweeping reforms. He consolidated the gains of the French Revolution while centralizing power. One of his most enduring contributions was the Napoleonic Code, a legal framework that influenced civil law around the world. Within just a few years, France transformed from a nation teetering on the edge of chaos to a centralized state with strong institutions. The achievements were staggering, but they came at the cost of personal freedoms as Napoleon's rule became increasingly authoritarian. The title of First Consul was just a stepping stone for Napoleon. His ambition knew no bounds, and he would soon convert the consulate into an empire, with himself as emperor. But that, as they say, is another chapter in this extraordinary saga. By 1805, Napoleon had crowned himself Emperor of the French and was embroiled in the War of the Third Coalition against a powerful alliance that included Austria and Russia. The stage was set for a showdown that would pit three emperors against each other. Napoleon, Tsar Alexander I of Russia, and the Holy Roman Emperor Francis II. On the eve of the battle, Napoleon was already at work crafting his strategy. He was outnumbered with approximately 68,000 troops against the Allied forces of about 90,000. Yet, he was undeterred. He relied on his generals, especially Marshal Soult and Marshal Davout, to implement intricate plans that would maximize their smaller number's impact. The battle commenced on December 2nd, 1805. A heavy fog covered the field, and Napoleon used this to his advantage. He gave the impression that the French army was in a weaker position than it actually was, luring the Allies into a trap. The pivotal moment came when the French stormed the Pratzen Heights, a central position that the Allies had prematurely abandoned. 
seizing this elevated ground, gave Napoleon a vantage point from which he could command his troops with surgical precision. With the heights under French control, Napoleon orchestrated the remainder of the battle like a grand conductor. He launched coordinated attacks, exploiting the Allies' disorganization and splitting their forces. The battle ended in a decisive French victory, decimating the Third Coalition's forces and capturing thousands of prisoners. Napoleon would later refer to the event as the Son of Austerlitz, seeing it as a shining moment in his military career. Austerlitz wasn't just a military triumph, it was a validation of Napoleon's tactical genius. It established him as a master strategist whose campaigns would be studied for generations to come. However, this victory also cemented his belief in his own invincibility, sowing the seeds for the hubris that would eventually contribute to his downfall. Napoleon was at the height of his powers, but there was one adversary he couldn't seem to subdue, Great Britain. Its naval supremacy made a direct attack impractical. So, Napoleon resorted to economic warfare, introducing the Continental System in 1806. The idea was simple, yet audacious. If he couldn't defeat the British militarily, he would cripple them economically. The Continental System aimed to block British trade with Europe, essentially imposing a continental embargo against British goods and vessels. Implementation was strict. French troops and customs officers ensured that ports from Lisbon to Riga were closed to British goods. Even neutral ships were subjected to searches, and smuggling was punished harshly. The continental system put immense pressure on European states. Some, like Spain and Russia, chafed under the economic strain and the infringement on their sovereignty. This led to growing animosity and challenges to French authority. Ironically, the embargo hurt not just Britain, but also France and its allies. European markets missed British goods, and local economies suffered. In France, inflation rose, and essential goods became scarce. In the end, the continental system was a double-edged sword. While it did strain the British economy, it was far from crippling. Moreover, it exacerbated tensions between France and its European neighbors, sowing the seeds of resistance that would eventually contribute to Napoleon's downfall. The Continental System serves as a case study in the limits of economic warfare. It reflected Napoleon's audacity and strategic ingenuity, but also his hubris. Ultimately, it was a policy that could neither break Britain nor bind Europe, a grand plan undone by economic complexities and geopolitical realities. The year was 1812, and Napoleon was growing impatient with Russia's reluctance to fully commit to the continental system. In a move many historians consider to be his greatest mistake, he assembled the largest army Europe had ever seen, a force of over 600,000 men, to invade Russia. On paper, the plan seemed audacious yet feasible. Napoleon aimed to quickly march to Moscow, force Tsar Alexander I to sue for peace, and returned to France before winter. But the scale of the campaign, moving hundreds of thousands of troops across vast distances, presented logistical nightmares. The initial stages of the campaign were somewhat successful, with French forces capturing cities like Smolensk. However, each victory drained the army's resources and morale. While Russia's scorched earth tactics left little for the French to forage, the Battle of Borodino was the campaign's most significant engagement, involving devastating losses for both sides. While Napoleon emerged victorious, the Russian army was not destroyed, and the cost in lives was immense, upwards of 30,000 French casualties alone. Reaching Moscow seemed like a triumph, but the reality was a hollow victory. The city had been abandoned and set ablaze, leaving the French army with no option for winter quarters and dwindling supplies. The retreat from Russia turned into a nightmare. Harassed by Russian forces and Cossacks, the army faced starvation and freezing temperatures. The Grande Armée, once a formidable force of over 600,000, was reduced to a mere fraction, with estimates suggesting fewer than 40,000 made it back to France. The invasion of Russia was a cataclysmic failure that shook the foundations of Napoleon's empire. Not only did it decimate his army, but it also shattered the aura of invincibility that had long surrounded him. 
It was a blunder of epic proportions, driven by overconfidence and a fundamental misunderstanding of the logistical and human costs involved. After a series of military defeats and the loss of support from key allies, Napoleon was forced to abdicate the throne in 1814. He was exiled to the island of Elba in the Mediterranean, a far cry from the palaces of Paris and the grand battlefields of Europe. While on Elba, Napoleon was not merely a brooding outcast. He was given sovereignty over the island and engaged in various projects, from infrastructure improvements to legal reforms. Yet, he couldn't ignore the news from France, where the restored Bourbon monarchy was struggling to maintain order and popularity. In less than a year, seizing an opportunity, Napoleon escaped from Elba and returned to France in a period that would be famously known as the Hundred Days. His return was nothing short of miraculous. He landed with a small force and began marching towards Paris, gathering supporters along the way. By the time he reached Paris, the incumbent King Louis XIII had fled, and Napoleon was greeted as a hero. He had turned what could have been a life of obscurity into a return to power, an audacious move that shocked and captivated Europe. But this return would be short-lived. The Battle of Waterloo in June 1815 was Napoleon's last stand. Despite a fiercely fought battle, his army was defeated by a coalition force led by the Duke of Wellington and Prussian Field Marshal Gebhard Leberecht von Blücher. After Waterloo, Napoleon was once again forced to abdicate. This time there would be no triumphant return. He surrendered to the British and was exiled to St. Helena, a remote island in the South Atlantic. In the isolated exile of St. Helena, Napoleon spent his final years. He penned his memoirs, engaged in intellectual pursuits, and received a few select visitors. Despite the isolation, his charisma and complexity continued to captivate those around him, leaving an indelible legacy that has fascinated the world ever since. After his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon was exiled to St. Helena, a remote island situated over a thousand miles off the west coast of Africa. The location was intentionally chosen for its inaccessibility, a place from which another escape was virtually impossible. Napoleon was confined to Longwood House, a modest residence that stood in stark contrast to the palaces he had once occupied. He was under constant surveillance by British guards and faced several restrictions, including limited contact with the outside world. Despite these restrictions, Napoleon was not entirely idle during his exile. He dictated his memoirs and engaged in discussions with his small entourage, which included a few loyal aides and officers. Through these activities, he sought to shape the narrative of his life and legacy. Yet for a man who lived for grandeur and action, the isolation and idleness were psychologically taxing. The once vibrant emperor was plagued by melancholy and deteriorating health, symptoms perhaps aggravated by the damp conditions on the island. On May 5, 1821, at the age of 51, Napoleon passed away. The official cause was listed as stomach cancer, although theories about possible poisoning have intrigued historians. Regardless of the cause, an era had come to an end. Though he died in exile, Napoleon's magnetic pull endured. His remains were returned to France in 1840 and interred at Les Invalides in Paris, where they rest to this day. The tomb has become a national monument and a testament to his enduring legacy. In death as in life, Napoleon has remained a figure of fascination and controversy. He is both revered and reviled, seen as a military genius and a tyrant, a reformer and a conqueror. His life continues to be studied, debated and dramatized, confirming that while empires may fall, legends endure. We've journeyed through the life of a man who began as a Corsican outsider, and rose to become one of history's most iconic leaders. Napoleon Bonaparte was many things, a military genius, a transformative statesman, a conqueror, and a fallen hero. His life was a tapestry of triumphs and tragedies, woven together by ambition, intellect, and a ceaseless desire for glory. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of the life and legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte. As we close, we invite you to ponder these complexities, to question and to understand, but above all, to never stop being curious about the people and events that have shaped our world.